another edition in our ongoing series of data that we review from New Voodoo's Ratings Prospects Study 24. I'm Mike O'Connor, marketing guy with Lee Jacobs. Ratings Pro Prospects Study 24 was what conducted in the uh, last part of Q2. Yeah, very, very tippy end of May, first couple of days, or the first day, actually, of June. Almost 3,200 people, uh, 14 to 64 nationwide. And we have all the composition reviewed in uh, prior videos. So let's not waste time here, Mike, but 14 to 64 is this time. Yep. Okay. And of course, the major theme of this, this video series is to focus on one very specific group that's going to move the needle for ratings. And we'll get into that. Um, but they're called RPS heavies. Lee will explain. We'll kind of re-explain that because it's so critical. And today we're going to cover all things contesting. Our previous videos had been about how to reach people with a message. And obviously in the game of radio these days, besides strategic marketing that you you might do if you launched a new uh, radio station or moved a, uh, a, you know, a big show from across the street, uh, you'd spend some money on strategic marketing like outdoor TV. But there's also tactical marketing, and that's what we're going to focus on here is where we're just trying to flip a meter or two or to convince a new set of diary keepers to change their behavior, hopefully over the long term, but at the very least over the short term, so you can move those numbers a tenth of a rating point or more and get a tactical advantage in this all important rate setting period. So today's focus is about contesting Lee Jacobs. Well, when we ask you know, the sample of 3,200 people, if they participated in a radio station contest or sweepstakes, and we gave them different, uh, when was the last time um, was the, the framework of this, but the percentages who said they did so in the past month, and I'll go left to right here, the total sample, a little 24. under a quarter. Yeah. The 15% subset of that sample who profile as people that we think are most likely to participate in ratings methodology with Nielsen, either in metered or in the diary world, about three and eight, 37% now say they participated in a radio station contest or sweepstakes in the past month. Now that starts to get my attention. And if that's not important enough for you, the RPS heavies, that dwindles down to 5%, one in 20 in our sample. But among that rarefied group who are likely to show up within the ratings methodology and listen to broadcast radio at least an hour a day. These are the people who can truly change your future because they listen enough to have enough quarter hours at sway that they could help you get to that next tier in the ratings. Over half, 54%, say they participated in a radio station contest or sweepstakes in the last month. If you break it out demographically, the 14 to 27s, the Gen Zs, 41%, millennials, and these are all among the ratings likely portion, 15% of this sample. Millennials, uh, 28 to 43, 49%. And that's where so much of the tonnage of AQH is. In it's the adult demo. Right. Gen X, which is now, and I say Gen X plus, because we've got the last five years of the baby boom in here. So now we're talking uh, 44 to 64, and now it drops down to 27%. Next to that, I show the, the ratings likely group who are core listeners to CHR, CHR or Hot AC. And really, that's just an example because we can break this data out by any of the major formats. We just happen to be showing the CHR Hot AC uh, P1s here. And 35% say they've participated in a radio station contest or sweepstakes in the past month. So then it comes down to how much cash does it have to be? Well, um, and in this case, it's about uh, the, uh, you know, the way that you're able to convert uh, somebody who might be a, a interested contest participant into some sort of action. And right. action always begins with uh, uh, something like a call or a text, or in this case, the opportunity to actually get this someone's data so you right. can reuse it. Because in the one first party data, one P yeah. data, we'd argue is probably more important in 2024 than P1, you know, first preference listening. Yeah. So when you ask them, how likely would you to be, would you be to share your email address for entry into a drawing for a cash prize of at least $100 or invitation to join a loyalty program, that actually bumps it up a few points among most of these breakouts. So the idea that maybe I'm going to get something back from the radio station by 
giving up some personal information of mine. And it's always the challenge at the radio station operational level. Do you really follow through with that? That's really where the rubber hits the road because you have tremendous power at your fingertips if you follow through on that promise that, oh, you want me to give up my email address? Fine, I'll do that. I'm that sort of a consumer. But what do I get back? And when do I get it back? Um, I would argue that the moment I hit send on my registration, something ought to come back, thanking me, congratulating me, saying, here's a first offer. Here's some client we can connect you with but something immediately because we all like that kind of instant gratification. And the RBS heavies were up to nearly seven in 10 yeah. who would be inclined to join your loyalty program. Right. And you can see over there on the right, among that breakout of ratings, likely CHR and hot ACP ones, there it literally is seven in 10. Yep. So what you got? I mean, that's a massive opportunity to get involved with the sales department and just keep churning this wheel. Yeah, we're putting a hundred bucks up here as sort of the universal incentive to get uh, data. But let's face it, we've seen that signing up for early on sales for concerts or, um, you know, for any kind of something for nothing or a client uh, coupon or savings, it can all work to fuel the data capture. And even more importantly, as you mentioned, the reward that has to happen almost instantly. They, we need to give some instant gratification. And... Uh, so, so that's the part I think that a lot of folks get. What many still might not totally grasp is the the importance of of that first party data, because it can then be used for far more cost effective ways of advertising. And we, you know, there's lots of different names for it. Twitter calls it tailored audiences. Facebook, Instagram call it custom audiences. Uh, Google, YouTube have a different name for it, and TikTok I think also uses the word custom audiences. Um, but these. These walled garden platforms give you the ability to ingest the email addresses of the folks in your loyalty program or who've signed up for contests and then model those people, that core list of folks, to find others that look like them from a data standpoint. And listen, we know a lot about the types of person who's going to register for a station loyalty program and participate in Nielsen tend to be from large households, generally with uh, school age or younger uh, children at home. There's a certain socioeconomic level. And so when you're modeling the data that you have for the top 1% correlations, you are really then mapping your market for likely Nielsen participants. And that, that mapping can be made even more efficient by overlaying your Nielsen data. And plus we have a couple of tricks uh, up our sleeve that we help our clients with. Uh, we've conducted research for a decade or more, Better and than. we've mapped most of the major Nielsen markets, minor Nielsen markets as well, with the survey-friendly household data. We have hundreds of thousands of records at yep. this. And we capture TSL information. So while it's recalled TSL, not exactly the same thing as Nielsen data, the, the overlay is pretty powerful. And then, of course, you are also able to use connected TV, uh, uh, online mobile apps, websites that aren't necessarily part of a walled garden through what we call programmatic media, using an onboarding platform like LiveRamp. That also gives us the ability to model audiences for lookalikes. So again, uh, now that we no longer have uh, even budgets that could accommodate a you know reasonable digital marketing uh, campaign, and we're really talking about couch cushion you know, spare change under the couch cushions. Um, using this data technique allows us to do a lot with a very little. And that's important because um, inflation bites. It not only reduces radio stations' ability to market contests, but we also know that nobody's got uh, the, the kind of cash laying around that they used to to bribe people to listen for short periods of time. Well, but the other part of that, Mike, is that, you know, frankly, in, you know, if, you know, at certain levels, the economy is doing just fine. At certain other levels, at at the consumer's actual purse, purse, you know, inflation's taken a bite. And we know that when, you know, if people are feeling a little stressed, somehow a slightly smaller prize gets pretty attractive. And we've been watching that for a few years now where, you know, two thirds or better, say $500 would absolutely get my attention. Though we're still at that about two and three, yes, $1,000 will get more people's attention, but two and three say they'll play for $500 alone. And 
you know, in a somewhat less competitive market or maybe a situation where you don't have a competitor that's uh, breathing a thousand dollars out into the community every couple of minutes, five hundred dollars <laughs> is still a great contest prize. Yeah, the incremental or marginal benefit that you're able to derive by doubling your contest budget doesn't really uh, the, the proportionality doesn't hold, at least theoretically right. on paper. Right. I mean, you get an additional 12 percent of the ratings, likely millennials, an additional 13 percent, maybe of the the heavy listening ratings, likely is the RPS heavies. You see only uh, an, an additional six percent among the ratings, likely CHR and hot ACP ones. But listen, all of this is negated if you've got a crosstown rival that's doing a thousand dollars an hour. Then you've just we know from past studies that the true contest players, the people who really care about this, will follow stations around depending and will actually do the the comparison shopping of well, yeah. they've got this much, they've got that much. Hmm. There are ways though to discredit those types of contests where somebody seemingly has unlimited cash across the street when we both know, or, or this group knows we don't. Um, and so we'll get to that in a second, but I wanted to briefly touch upon the uh, the old argument between, uh, is it, do we play the name game? Do we uh, make people jump through hoops by signing up online and then listening for their name or their keyword, or can we just simply do a correct text or a caller? And listen, the bottom line here is that you know, while I could maybe crow about the, among the little subset who were RPS heavies, the ratings likely who listen at least an hour a day, there's a couple of points. It's really pretty much the same number. Yep. They'll, they'll play if you offer registering online and listening for your name often is the, the standard bearer uh, involving an app is actually the winner this time around. And that could be important for reasons that we can touch on later yep. you to text in and win fine caller 10 or whatever to win is is still doable it's just that it's a little less powerful though at least with the call-ins you get instant winner winner audio and we love having that for reasons that we'll disclose in the next couple of minutes yep so our recommendation in general for small prizes, larger prizes is diversify your approach to interaction. But remember that whenever you can grab data, the reusability makes it more valuable. And I would also say uh, to Lee's point just a moment ago, look at that 76% RPS heavy number involving using your radio station app. That's going to be a big deal. And we'll show you again in a minute. Um, but in terms of data capture, um, obviously there's a trade-off. The problem with data capture is that it's a higher bar. There's a hoop that, and you don't get everybody who's exposed to your advertising message to jump through it. And that in turn then makes the delay between the time you start a contest and the, and the time that you're you know, expecting the ratings reward to materialize, that, that can be a bit of a delay. And with stations not having the kinds of budgets to run as long, uh, because their prize budget is smaller, their advertising budget is real kind of incremental, um, that could be an issue. However, there are platforms that are very highly rated in terms of their ability to reach RPS yes and RPS heavies. Uh, Lee, I know we did this in an earlier video, but uh, several of the walled gardens usually show up at the top of our list. Oh, absolutely. Um... And now, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Oh, well, TikTok. I mean, ultimately, it's the Alphabet Duo and uh, and the Meta Duo. Yeah. And depending upon demos, increasingly, particularly if you're going to get younger consumers involved. Yep. And, and so we had mentioned earlier that these walled gardens, which reach uh, are very ubiquitous within that uh, that ratings inclined universe, um, and, and they they also have that ability to repurpose data and create custom audiences, which uh, which then allow you to model for lookalikes. Uh, there's one other advantage using these types of wall garden platforms, ones that are appropriate for your particular radio station target audience, is there's one click registration or data capture. So you offer an incentive and one click will allow the social media data connected with the account, uh, the account holder to auto populate and with submit and a you know a little privacy policy disclosure and your official contest rules you suddenly own the data. Now, it's a little bit more expensive way to advertise, but again, remembering all of the residual benefits, that can be important. The other thing that we like to do is we like to run 
kind of two pronged campaigns. On the left, the one click, uh, you know, offer the incentive and tell people, uh, you know, simply uh, give us your name and then we'll tell you when to listen. And once you have them in data, we're then able to turn around and use retargeting ads to constantly remind contest participants about the appointment times to listen. And those are really the kind of the two things that you need to do when you're going, going to involve hoops. It's a more complex type of promotion. But now with this one click benefit and our expertise in setting up and managing these types of campaigns and remembering the residual benefits, this can be an incredibly cost effective way to just hammer those few zip codes where all the heavy meters are. But there is an issue when it comes to credibility that we need to address. It's a bit of an elephant in the room. Right. And we've been tracking this for a number of years now. Most radio station contests are rigged. They never really give away the prizes. And here are the percentages who agree. And you can see that by the time you get to the ratings like these who are heavy listeners, you're nearly two in five, 38%. The young end, especially the Gen Zs and the millennials, you know, heading for half. Fortunately, among those uh, in the ratings likely pool who are currently P1 to CHR hot AC, we're down a little bit, you know, that's a little more trusting somehow. But ultimately, we think this ties so much to one particular large group that tends to operate contests all the time. So their stations are heavy on solicits and very light on payoffs to their contests. Not a lot of winner promos because, frankly, they're mostly national contests and they're a little cagey about who's actually winning those games. And when people who like to play contests don't hear a lot of winners on the air or a lot of announcement of winners or a lot of celebration, then they get suspicious and figure, eh, they're rigged, which hurts all radio station contests because if you think they're rigged, you're probably not going to jump through the hoops or over the hurdles to play the game and do the thing that, you know, the station so badly wants consumers to do right then to get them that those extra quarter hours. And while it is possible to hang those doing national contests with some of that fraud baggage, if you make an issue of it, the fact is, Lee, that when it comes to national contests offering cash prizes every hour, they don't come with an eight baggage, basically. Right. When we ask people, would they be more likely to play a local station contest offering 500 bucks or a national or larger contest where there's a grand, but people all over the country are competing to win? Yeah. It, of course, you know, sides with the smaller prize, but where yeah, people wins. in my area are all, all the winners are in my area. That makes a lot of sense. But that's not how people are thinking. That's not, it's just, you know, it's like how many turns are there lock to lock on the steering wheel on your car? I, I don't know, but some engineer knows it's just not it, it, within my, uh, it's not something I think about. So when we ask people about group contesting, we find that across the wide sample, three and five, 59%, no idea, never heard of it. And then among the smaller group who have heard of it, Better than half of those say, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Because in their minds, there are more prizes or more opportunities to win. So that must be good. Now, if they really think about it, it's not good, but that's not how people work. When you get it down to the 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 heavy listening rating ratings likely is the RPS heavies. Sure, 32% or you know, it's only 32% are unaware of group contesting, but literally half of them think that well, that's pretty good. Must be, right? So to wrap up this video, let's share our best practice in maximizing all of the benefits and minimizing the trade-offs that come with executing contests as a way of moving the ratings needle. And I think it's important to understand that a major change in methodology occurred uh, what, a couple of years ago now, a couple of summers ago. And, you know, the transition to wearables and PPM markets is what, you know, the major takeaway was. But along with that came this little companion app. Right. Now, Nielsen had gamified the survey participation experience uh, for years prior to the introduction of this app uh, with a website called My Meter and Me. Mm -hmm. And what would you describe it as? We even interviewed somebody. Uh, remember uh, Aletta uh, from yeah. the Pennsylvania market, a former Nielsen uh, uh, participant panelist. And yep. uh, she explained uh, the different rewards and incentives that were offered to her right. throughout but the uh, through my meter and me she had access to additional contests additional yeah. prizes that were on offer 
So that she definitely tuned into that and definitely informed us that these are people who are looking for yeah. the little something extra. What's yeah. in it for them? How do they get a little something, something? And so here we have a, a situation where Nielsen is using a bridge on this smaller meter format so that instead, you know, in some cases of having to use the at-home beacon or data hub, the companion app can grab the data and upload it yeah. to them. So now you've got an app on your phone where it's right there to play the games all yeah. the time. With push notifications happening all the time to incentivize folks right. to keep that thing handy because why? Because it's a cheap way for Nielsen to in real time download the data so they don't lose a respondent not making the daily intent or losing fewer respondents, I guess, thus lowering their cost of sample acquisition and improving their margins. Right. So how can we take advantage of that? Well, what did we talk to you about uh, three, four minutes ago about using your app and how that 75% of RPS heavies would engage a radio station app to play a game. And the game that we like is a keyword-based game because remember, we're trying to put this all together. We're trying to use data capture in the most convenient uh, way possible. We also want to insulate ourselves if we're a national contest from some of the attacks that a local contest could, you know, it could hang some credibility baggage on us. We also want to be able to give away a lot of cash or at least give away the opportunity to have a lot of cash, even if we don't have a big budget. We need to be able to keep up with the national contest folks who are pooling radio station contest money and are able to offer cash more frequently. You may be a local operation without that same dexterity, but you still want to keep up with the Joneses and offer enough appointment time. So this idea, uh, which we've been you know executing for several years now, involves giving out keywords at set time. And the keyword becomes your password into a, a password protected app that is essentially a digital online scratch card. That can be a scratch card, it can be a slot machine, it can be a wheel, it can be anything you want it to be. It can be find the hidden morning show uh, behind the bushes, if that's what you want it to be. The important thing is you're offering the keywords at set times, which act as the pass to get into the game to play for that instant opportunity at winning 500, 1,000, or even $5,000 worth of uh, cash that we like to keep a cap on it because of the possibility of hacking. And, uh, and so we're able to go longer, offer more frequency, capture more data, and compete with national contests if we're, if we're local, uh, avoid the baggage of getting attacked for credibility. Nobody really gives away uh, the money because we're not really, uh, this is not something that looks like a national contest if we if we choose to execute it that way. Now, most people aren't going to win, uh, but the point is you can control your budget. So if you only have $10,000 to give away, but you want to make your contest last oh, 12 weeks, we'd be able to do that because and be compliant with the FCC because we're randomly programming in uh, a random outcomes to determine you know, when somebody uh, spins the wheel or scratches the scratch game, the winning occasions are predetermined by randomly determined times, hence keeping it legal and right. allowing you to pool your money across more weeks and more contest occasions. So you can learn more all about that by contacting us at tellmemore at newvoodoo.com. And we also have uh, um, other videos that we've been posting from RPS24. Lee, I know you'll also do one-on-one -on -one consultations and uh, somebody doesn't have to be a, a client to get involved. Right. I was going to try to make some uh, not adroit uh, bridge from scratching and winning to we've barely scratched the surface of the oh, RPS 24 oh. data here. Like, uh, that's why I'm not on the air for years and years. But, you know, we've just scratched the surface of the data and we would be glad to walk you through it personally. Uh, even if you're not currently a client, if you think you might be someday, hit us up with an email at tellmemore at newvoodoo.com and we'll get you on the schedule. Love to present the data to you. New Voodoo builds digital products and conducts research and marketing campaigns for clients. It's easy to get in touch. Drop us a line at tellmemore at newvoodoo.com.